Let's try this again. Let's grab your hymn books. Hymn number 205. Let's all stand. We'll do some singing. Make sure you sing loud, please. I'm not 100% back yet, so uh, sing a little extra loud. I'd appreciate it. Hymn 205. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and long. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still in all of my heaven. second verse. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Soon he's coming back to welcome me Far beyond the starry sky I shall win my fight to worlds unknown I shall reign with him on high Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know Fills my It's Thomas. Good to see you all this evening. We're going to have a word of prayer and get our services uh, started tonight. Brother Dennis, if you would, sir, please lead us in prayer this evening. Father, we thank you, Lord. We can meet in your house, Lord, and we just thank you, Father, that uh, you know people are starting to feel better, Lord. We just thank you for that. And, and uh, Lord, we just pray, Lord, for the services tonight, Lord, and pray you bless, Lord. Help us to uh, really just help us to soak it in, Lord, and, uh, and, and apply it, Lord. I just pray for this. And, just pray all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Please be seated. Nice to see you this evening. Yes, there's a lot of folks that are feeling better, and it seems like every day I hear from somebody who says, yeah, we're feeling much better, and then I get another call from somebody or text message saying, oh, by the way, we're sick. And so uh, we're just swapping them out, uh, one for the other. But um, well, as far as announcements go, we are planning on having our soup and salad uh, supper this uh, weekend, this uh, Sunday night. We'll be meeting an hour earlier at 5 o'clock and having a great time of fellowship. And the tables are still set up. All we need is the soup right now. And so uh, come and join us uh, that evening. Uh, we have some activities and stuff. And uh, Brother Stephen and Sister Dye are taking care of that. Looking forward to some good, good time. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a ho Christmas holiday theme. So, uh, you know, we're almost, we're almost in February, and we've still got our Christmas decorations up, which is intentional because we're going to leave these up until we've had this fellowship. Even if we postpone it again and we're in March, we're still going to have – no, that's not going to happen. But um, so come and join us this Sunday night, all right? Uh, as far as announcements, that's all I've got. I do have an outline for everyone. I'm going to hand that out. And uh, Brother Stephen, if you would, let's go over our memory verse, if you would, please. Thank you very much. Amen. Would you mind? Verse 24. New verse for the for the year. January, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24. <clears throat> and if you're there, you can read that nice and loud with me. It says, But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That, that I am the Lord, Lord which, which exercises loving, loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the, the earth. For in these, these things I delight, saith the Lord. It's Jeremiah 9, 24. Anybody else been working on that this week? On your bed of languishing, as we're all recovering, cramming this in. <coughs> no, that's okay. Still working on it. Tom? 
Okay, grab your hymn books again. Hymn 266. We'll sing Honey in the Rock. We'll sing the first and the last verse. And again, they sing out loud. Hymn 266. Let's all stand together. Oh, my brother, do you know the Savior who is wondrous, kind, and true? He's the rock of your salvation. There's honey in the rock for you. Oh, there's honey in the rock, my brother. There's honey in the rock for you. Leave your sins for the blood to cover. There's honey in the rock for you. Oh, that last verse. Then go out through the streets and byways. Preach the word to the many or few. Say to every fallen brother, there's honey in the rock for you. Oh, there's honey in the rock, my brother. There's honey in the rock for you. Leave your sins for the blood to cover. Amen. Thank you very much, Thomas. Amen. If you have an outline tonight, you'll see uh, we're going to see the title of the message tonight. It says, The Whole Bible is not written to you, uh, but it was written for you. And I hope that doesn't throw you any. Uh, please do be reminded of the fact that many of the books of the Bible were directed towards very specific groups of people and individuals. Uh, quite a bit of the Old Testament, of course, directed to the children of Israel. Uh, but some of those books, of course, directed to even some of the Gentile nations, you know, like the book of Obadiah, for instance. And uh, so um, uh, even in the New Testament, of course, all the general epistles and, uh, excuse me, the, the epistles were directed towards individual churches. But um, I want to direct your attention to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we were there, I think, last week or the week before. And we're going to start there. And you could see in your outline, we're going to be heading to here to a couple of the epistles, the book of Romans and the book of 1 Corinthians. But um, this is what we read just a few weeks ago um, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul, was, of course, is writing to Timothy, and he mentions to him very specifically in verse number 15 that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What we're going to be talking about tonight is the purpose for the writing of the Word of God, and I have two very specific things, as you can see in your outline, for learning and for example. But uh, you'll notice here that it's written with the idea of the knowledge of salvation. So you read the scriptures which make you wise unto salvation uh, through faith. Um, where are we at here? Verse number, um, uh, verse number 15, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. There's benefit. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, so we're going to be talking about purpose for the Word of God tonight. So let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Father, I want to thank you. It's good to be in your house tonight. Thank you for those that are here this evening. I'm thankful that the children's ministries are going tonight, and I do pray uh, for the young folks as they're being instructed downstairs and for our teenagers as they're being ministered to. So thankful, Lord, that we have ministries that can um, meet the needs of these young folks. And I do pray for the time that we'll spend together here uh, uh, in this auditorium that you'd bless in the teaching of your word tonight. That you'd encourage us, Father, to uh, uh, put our minds, focus our attention on your precious word, which, has, um, which, which is profitable for us. And I pray that we gain some of that um, profit tonight and also, Lord, uh, set our minds to looking for things that will be beneficial for us in the future in your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Well, things that are written are often written for purpose. I was uh, reading an article just a few weeks ago. Um, I, I am not a big, um, I'm not a big uh, fiction reader. Uh, I always read, most of the books I read are nonfiction. Um, and I was reading an article a few weeks ago about the benefits of reading fiction. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, I always think of fiction as just entertainment, you know. And so it was, it's, it's a, it was a business article about uh, folks uh, that read fiction a lot because it helps them 
Uh, it helps them to, to develop problem solving skills and also makes them more empathetic towards the plights of others. And so if you're working in an environment where you're working around a lot of people, you want to develop good interpersonal skills, well, fiction reading helps develop interpersonal skills. So I was an interesting article. I thought the article was kind of fictitious myself. But anyway, I read it. But uh, so, so even, even a book that's fictional has purpose to it. And I've always said that anybody that's an author, anybody that writes has an agenda. Everybody has an, puts their agenda into whatever they're writing. So every, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, all has purpose to it. And so um, when we look at the Bible, this is not a matter of fiction or nonfiction. It's a matter of the fact that God has given us his word, and it has purpose built into it. There's a purpose for everything in the Bible. Now, as I said in our title here, the whole Bible was not written to you. So the, the books of the Bible are individual books that were written for specific purposes and written particularly to individuals uh, in, the New, in the New Testament. Um, so it's not necessarily that it's written to you, but the point of it is, is whether it's directed to you or not to you, uh, it is for you. Everything in the Bible is for you. There is something in the scriptures that God has intended for you to gain from it. As it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That means all scripture is profitable. All scripture has intention. All scripture is given to benefit you in some way. And so as we look at these benefits tonight, we're going to look at two very specific things this evening. Uh, and Romans chapter 15 is where we're going to start. And so if you'll turn over there, turn there to first uh, Romans chapter 15, if you please. And um, this particular portion of scripture, um, this where we're reading at tonight is actually a New Testament quote from the Old Testament, so we'll be looking at both of those this evening. So if you have the opportunity in just a few moments, we're going to be going back to Psalm 69. But here in Romans chapter 15, uh, verse number 3 and 4 says this. It says, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, and so making reference back to the Old Testament, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 69, For as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so we have this very direct statement uh, here in the New Testament, given by inspiration of God, by the way, about a passage of scripture in the Old Testament, given by inspiration of God. And we're being told here in the New Testament that this was written for a purpose. And of course, the purpose is our learning. Um, we, we, the purpose that the, these, this Old Testament passage was written was so that we can learn. And please understand that now we're in the New Testament reading this. This is scripture. It's given by inspiration to God, and it's also profitable. So not only are we leading, reading and learning from the Old Testament, but we're now reading and learning from the New Testament, okay? So there's a lot of learning going on. I want to just give you a, a very simple thing about the word learning. It's a, ter it's a term that's used all throughout the Bible. It has to do with doctrine and teaching or instruction. It's the precepts or the principles. In other words, when we read the Bible, there are things, we're not just learning like a history lesson or we're not just learning, you know, about people or places or things. We're actually building our understanding of doctrine and what we know from the scriptures about God, about ourselves, our understanding of all things that have to do with, with, our, with this, this relationship we have with God. We're learning from that. The more that you get into the book, the more that you read, the more that you study, the more that you learn. You don't just learn the Bible just from having a Bible in your house. They can sit on the shelf forever, and you'll not get a thing out of it except a little bit of dust collected. And so the idea is we got to get in it and read it and understand it. I grew up with a Bible in my house. We always had a Bible in our house. It was that big, and it had pictures. And the only time I ever remember opening that book and looking through it is when I was a kid and looking at the pictures. That was it. Was, is there profitable? Is there benefits? I mean, I, I, knew, I knew what Cain and Abel looked like because I saw the picture. 
And I knew Jesus. He had the long hair and the robes and everything, blonde hair, blue eyes. I knew exactly what Jesus looks like because I had the pictures, right? Where's the benefit? The benefit is from reading and understanding and learning. The Bible was given for our learning. It's not just to occupy space, not just to say I got a book. It's for our learning. Learning comes from reading. So we have this idea of learning. We develop teachings from the Word of God. Now, please keep your place here and go all the way in the back uh, to Psalm 69, if you please. And that's, uh, this is where the, that portion of Scripture is quoted from, Psalm 69. And I'm just going to read a little bit of it here. Uh, just a couple verses, 69, verse number 7. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach. Shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. And so there we see the direct quote in verse number 9 that's quoted over in the book of Romans. But also, you'll notice uh, another very familiar portion of Scripture there, again in verse number 9. It says, For the zeal of thine house um, hath eaten me up. Does anybody remember where that's from in New Testament? Who, who, um, what's that related to? Well, you'll read that. There's another place you'll actually read that quote uh, in the New Testament. Matter of fact, my uh, inner... Inner uh, period, uh, inner column thing here. He gives, he gives me the reference here in the Gospel of John. But what's it in reference to? Anybody know? Ding, ding, ding. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. You must have been reading your Bible, Tom. So uh, when Jesus uh, was overturning the tables in the temple, uh, his, uh, uh, the apostles uh, makes mention of that that after all that took place, they were reminded of what it said in the scriptures, the zeal that hath had eaten me up. And so we, we, they, they made that connection to the psalm here. Um, but please notice what it's talking about here in, in reference to reproach. Um, again, uh, I, am bor- uh, I have borne reproach. Shame hath covered me. That's verse number seven. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, an alien unto my mother's children. What, he, what he's talking about here is the, uh, is the difficulties um, that the psalm, this is David, of course, writing in this psalm, but, of course, prophetically speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're making statements in reference to the, the, the burden or the shame or the struggles that that individual is going through because of their zeal for God. So, in other words, when, a, when an individual has a passion for the things of God and they're going to serve God no matter what the cost then they're willing to pay the price, even of alienation from your own family. And, of course, that's what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. His, 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 of course, his mom knew the deal, but all of his siblings did not. And we were introduced to that throughout the Gospels until we see in the book of Acts that eventually his brothers, um, doesn't say anything about his sisters at that point, but his brothers, of course, get saved. And, his, of course, his brother James becomes the pastor of the church that's there in Jerusalem. And, of course, uh, his brother Judas, or Jude, ends up writing the epistle that we have there. And, and so, but through, his, through his, his life, his brethren, he was alienated from them. Well, we see the same. And please notice what it says. And this is where the quote is in the book of Romans, that the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. In other words, the folks that hate the things of God hated me. That's what he's saying. And that's exactly what Jesus plays through, and that's exactly what Jesus presents to his apostles. The world hates me, and if the world hates you, it's not because of you. The world's going to hate you because of me. He reminds us that this difficulty that we're going to face in this world has to do with our relationship to him. This is the lesson, if you would please go back with me to Romans, this is the lesson that's being played through here in the book of Romans. Now, of course, the scriptures are written for our learning. In in other words, we build doctrine, teaching from reading the Bible. But we also learn from, you know, the lessons throughout here. And the lesson here in the book of Romans is about this idea that if you're going to serve Christ, you're going to suffer persecution. You are going to have to deal with some things because people don't like God. Well, they'll put up with a God with a little g, and they'll put up with God in a very general sense. But when you start getting specific and start speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ 
and the necessity for salvation through faith, and you start talking about things like sin that separates us uh, from God, then folks are not going to be happy, and there's going to be reproach. They're reproaching God for, his, for who he is, and because of that, they're going to reproach you. That's the lesson that's drawn out of Romans chapter 15. Now, please notice um, the three things in, in particular I have uh, listed down there uh, what learning provides for us. Um, very, it's a very clear statement here, verse number, um, uh, yeah, I'm in the right, oh, I'm in chapter 14, that's why I didn't look right. Verse number three, there we go. Um, and verse number four, and whatsoever things are written aforetime are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Those three particular things, patience, comfort of the scriptures, and hope. Those three things are what we learn. Now, when the word patience is used in the Bible, patience is, is used in reference to situations and things. Um, I've mentioned this many times before. Often you'll see the word long-suffering in the Bible. And th this is basically in, in general terms. And as far as I've been able to discern from the Scriptures, it's pretty reliable to say that when the Bible says long-suffering, it has to do with putting up with one another, okay? Because God puts up with you. God is long-suffering to us word, and so we need to be long-suffering with others. Patience has more to do with things as compared to people. So we're patient through tribulations. We're patient through trials. We're patient through the, the difficulties of this world. And so the situation that is being presented here is, in, again, in verse number four, is um, and through patience and comfort of scriptures. So what we learn is patience. We're going to, we're, if we choose to live a godly life, if we choose to follow God, follow the Lord Jesus Christ, then the reproach of them that reproach God are go, is going to fall on us. So we're going to have to be patient through the difficulties. In other words, understand that this is a nor, normal thing. This is something that all believers have had to deal with. That is difficult times. Sometimes that comes from folks we don't even know, which, you know, happens all the time. You start telling people about the fact you're a Christian, and they look at you funny, and, you know, but a lot of times it comes from family members. It comes from the people that are the closest to us. I do want to remind you, of course, David wrote Psalm 69 that we quoted earlier, and um, who was the one who persecuted David right off the, right off the bat? His, his, his father-in-law. Watch out for father-in-laws, man. Just telling you, all right? <laughs> there we go. So, you know, this is, this is immediate. This was family. Uh, even, even, as, even David's own wife, um, she had some serious issues. Now, I don't know, you know, dancing in front of the Ark of the Covenant in, the, in, a, in a white robe, I'd, I'd, get, I'd look at him kind of funny too. But, uh, you know, his, his own wife begins to, to ridicule him. And, uh, and then his own son, Absalom, uh, uh, turns on him, uh, betrays him. This is the kind of stuff that David dealt with all through his life. Um, so even with David, some of, the some of the closest people to him are the ones he had to deal with the most. That This was the situations he had to be patient through, the difficult situations he went through. And, and so if David can write these things and... The, and, and, of course, Paul the Apostle quotes him in the New Testament reminding us these things were written that you can learn something from this. David went through the ringer because of his, of his um, relationship to God, and so will you. Learn to be patient. God did great things in David's life. And if you, as you read through the, those passages where he had to deal with Saul for years, this wasn't a matter of just one event. It was years. Is, is this thing ever going to end? Uh, even in t situations where David had the opportunity of even seeing King Saul killed, he wouldn't do it because he wouldn't touch God's anointed. He was patient with the situation, and God rewarded him for it. Patience is what we learn from reading things like that in the Old Testament, from reading through the book of, uh, of, of the, the Chronicles uh, concerning the life of David. We learn these things. We also learn comfort. Please notice again in verse number uh, 4 in chapter 15 where it says comfort of scriptures. That word comfort is used many places in the Bible. Often it is used in reference to the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, John chapter 15, John chapter 16, 
uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about his, him, the fact that he's leaving. And it's expedient that I go because if I do not go, the comforter will not come. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. That's the term that Jesus often uses in reference to the Holy Spirit. He calls him the comforter. And so we see comfort given here. It's the same word. And the comfort, the word comfort itself means to be called alongside. It's someone that actually comes alongside to encourage and to help and to be a benefit in every way possible. In reference to the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, the moment that we're saved, comes into our life and takes up occupation in our lives and is there with us all throughout our life to encourage us, to teach us, to admonish us, to, to give us uh, direction and understanding about things. The Holy Spirit is that, is, I, I like to relay it to almost like that still, small voice that we see in the Old Testament with the story of Elijah, that, that, that uh, presence of God in our life to really deal with us about things that's going on. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not like let your conscience be your guide kind of thing. We're not talking about Jiminy Cricket here. You know, We're talking about the Holy Spirit of God who is there to, and will always be there. So that's the, term, that's the word that's being used. But here it's related directly to the Scriptures, and rightfully so. Who's the author of the Word of God anyway? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed. That word breath that's used there in first in uh, in first uh, excuse me second Timothy chapter three, again the Holy Spirit of God is often uh, another term that's often used in reference to the Holy Spirit is, is the breath of God a breath that's that that idea of a spirit and, and so the um, this this connection is then made but we also see the very fact that the holy men of God in, what's that uh, is that First Peter holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Spirit of God is the author of the Scriptures themselves. And the Spirit of God worked through, through inspiration, worked through each one of those that actually penned these Scriptures. And so the Scriptures are a product of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so it is most appropriate to, to make this connection here that, that, that Paul makes by saying comfort of Scriptures because that the comforter is the author of the scriptures. And so the purpose of not only the presence of the Spirit of God in your life, but the purpose of the Word of God, which is sitting in front of you tonight, is to be that guide and that direction and that encouragement and that help to be the comforter. It's as if, it's as if the Holy Spirit that's in you is now ministering through us into the very Word that He authored Himself. And you, it's, it's kind of like having a battery with both terminals connected. That's a good thing. And the juice is flowing, and the energy is there, and the purpose that's put into it is now, is now functional. It's actually working the way it's supposed to. It is, it's, a, it's hard to imagine that a believer that has the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them would not be interested at all in getting into the book that the Holy Spirit of God authored. That just that makes no sense to me. You know, a person who has been born again, they should, they should have a hunger and a thirst for the things of God. And I, I just got to say this as plain as I can. Somebody who says that they're saved and has no interest in the Scriptures, there's something wrong. I mean, the red flag goes up, and I'd say, you better ask yourself if this thing is actually real in your life if you have no desire or interest for the very Word of God that the Holy Spirit of God penned that you claim is inside of you. There ought to be some kind of an appetite for it. And so when we're saved, God has given us the Word of God, and the, one of the purposes of the Word of God is to bring comfort in our lives. That's, that's that idea of encouragement and help. Um, it's, it's there to, um, um, to assist us, to minister to us in many different ways. Uh, early in my Christian life, after I got saved, I, I know I've shared this with you many times. My mother-in-law bought us, uh, bought me a Bible, bought Joyce one. You know, one of the standard looking. I got a black one, she got a white one. You know, and uh, I still own it. It's got scribbles all over it. But I started, I started reading it, and uh, I was, I was just fascinated, fascinated. I was 20, 20 years old, never read the Bible in my life, and um, 
I opened it up for my, you know, the first time kind of thing and started reading it, and it, was, it just floored me. And I, I've, not, I've not gotten over it since. It's the Word of God. It's the very Word of God. And so not only do we have this patience and this comfort of the Scriptures, but please also notice uh, there at the end of verse number 4, it talks about that we might have hope, that we might have hope. And, and the word hope is not a hope so, like a hope, I hope this thing all works out good. We don't have a hope so um, kind of faith, all right? We have a hope in God. That's more than hope so. Uh, this is a blessed hope. That word hope has to do with expectation. When a person says, I have hope, as a believer, when we say we have hope, that, that has to, that's, that's, that's rooted in God, and there's an expectation. So Jesus Christ promised that he's going to return. He said, I, you know, I go to my father, and, and uh, you know, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I have an expectation that Jesus Christ is coming back for me. That is a blessed hope. So hope is rooted. Hope is not just an imaginary, I hope this thing works out like you're wishing it. Uh, hope, is, hope is a solid expectation in something that has been determined. And, of course, what's been determined, it's been determined by God. And if God determines something, he sets something in motion, you can be assured it's going to take place. And so our hope is rooted in that. So when we get into the Bible, we read the Scriptures, and we begin to understand, like, for instance, this passage is rooted back in the Old Testament. Again, Psalm 69, written by David. David's talking about the struggles that he went through. And so we, as you read the life of David, you begin to understand how God worked things out, what God things, what he went through, the trials and the struggles and the difficulties. A lot of, a lot of serious ups and downs. David made some serious mistakes, but God brought him through every one of them. And God brought David to a place uh, he was the apple of God's eye, okay? In other words, God has, was really focused on his affection towards David, and he was going to make sure that everything he determined for David's life would come to fruition, period. And so we read these things in the Old Testament, and we see the life of David, and we see his frailties, and we see his mistakes, and we see God working every single step of the way. And then we take a step back, and we're reading these things, and we're learning from that, and we make some conclusions. I'm a child of God. God saved me. God loves me. God has something that he's going to do with me. God has a plan for my life. I'm going to make mistakes, maybe as serious as the ones that David made. But God has a plan for me. And if God did all these great things and worked all these miracles in David's life to bring about the things that he determined, is it possible that God could do that for me? Yes, I have hope. Not hope in my ability of keeping things right and squaring things away. And My hope is not rooted in myself or my own abilities. My hope is rooted solidly in God. My expectations are in Him. And so... One, these, are, these are the things that this particular portion of Scripture introduces to us. That the, that the, and, of course, again, we're reading here in the New Testament. He's taking us directly back to the Old Testament. He's giving us a direct quote from, from the Psalms, and he's saying there's something to be learned here. Learn the lesson from what you read, that you, can have, that you should have patience, that Scriptures were given to give you comfort or encouragement, come alongside of you put, it, put you, put its arms around you and say, this is going to work, and then hope, an expectation that what God says and what God promises will take place. And I simply believe God. So this is one of the purposes of the Scripture, and that is, that is for our learning and that we would have patience, comfort of Scripture, and, of course, hope. And the next example I have here, and I've just pulled out two portions of Scripture, of course, as, exam as examples, and the second one is an example of examples, okay? Is that, is that a paradox or an oxymoron? I'm not sure. But um, please notice uh, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, uh, just by way of back background, uh, the church in Corinth was a mess, it was filled with people that had some serious issues. There were moral issues. There were a lot of infighting. 
Uh, it was a church filled with folks that were very carnal. In other words, they were fleshly oriented as compared to being spiritually oriented. Um, Paul, of course, was the, uh, was the fellow that, that got that church started. Timothy had worked there for a while. Titus had worked there for a while. Um, matter of fact, Apollos, uh, the evangelist Apollos had been through there, and he had ministered there for a while. So, that, I mean, they, they, had, they had a good group of folks. There's, there's, no, there's nothing that can be faulted in the fact that they didn't have good instruction uh, and individuals that were ministering and discipling and doing some great work there, okay? None, no excuse, um, but they had some issues. And if you read through the epistles, First and Second uh, 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 Corinthians, you, you'll begin to understand a lot of the moral uh, problems that they had. And so uh, Paul is writing in this epistle here, and I'm going to, uh, if you would notice in your notes, drop them down to verse number 11, and it says this, um, it says, uh, now all these things happened unto them for ensamples. Now, that's an old, of course, old English word. Uh, we would use the word example. Matter of fact, you'll see in verse number six, if you just look back a little bit, it says, now these things were our examples. There's with the X. It's the same exact word. Uh, and, uh, and examples. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't. And there's several places where the word and uh, the S is used in there. I don't know if all King James has the S in there. Does anybody have a in verse number uh, verse number eleven? Anybody have a the X an example in your King James Bible? I honestly I do not know why N sample is there as compared to X sample. I don't know that one. I guess I, missed, I, I fell asleep in that class when I was in Bible college, so I'm not sure. Okay, but um, it's the same word. So if you're, if, you, if you're more familiar with example, like I am, I just put it down here, it just says it's in the text, okay? But these things, uh, these things happen unto them for examples, that, um, that they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. That ends of the world is talking about the day and age that we live in. So what he's saying is things were written in the past for the folks that are alive today. He gets the point? That's what he's saying. Uh, wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I'll stop right there with verse number. Um, I'll, we'll read down through a little bit more in just a little bit, okay? But um, please notice that the, there's a purpose here. The purpose, of course, is to give us examples or examples, okay? That's the, that's the purpose. And um, the, the word example is a, um, by definition, is a pattern uh, of conformity or a pattern of warning. So, for example, okay, example about examples, okay, uh, my wife used to sew quite a bit. She doesn't sew as much as she used to, but she sewed all the time, and she would often buy the patterns. You know, if you've ever sewed things, you, get, you buy a pattern, and then you pull out these patterns, and you get all the pins and stuff, and, and, uh, and then run it through the sewing machine. You know, it's, you, you get the idea, Okay. So the, the word example in the Bible has to do with this idea of a pattern that's been set. So in reference to something on a good side, it's conformity. If you will build it according to this example, then you will have what that is. That's a good thing, right? And, and so the idea is conformity to something as an example. Somebody has a blueprint, okay? Somebody in engineering puts together a blueprint, hands it to a guy in the shop, and if they would just build it like the engineer said, it would be fine, right? Anyway, we'll just move on from there. So the idea is of an example is something that has been given to relay a pattern. So now the good side, right? Now the bad side, of course, of an example is a warning, right? So. When you go and you, and you uh, and there's a lot of great videos online about fails. I love watching fail videos online. They are so funny. People do the dumbest things, right? And, and so, um, so not only is fail videos great for entertainment, how not to cut a tree down, you know, but they're also extended for our warnings, okay? And so when, you know, when Denny ties the rope to the back bumper and flies out at 40 miles an hour hoping the tree will go in the right direction, don't be surprised when the back wheels fall off, you know, zinging up in the air. Oh, I just love those videos. See, these things are written as an example. And in this particular portion of Scripture in the book of 1 Corinthians, what he's making reference to are the fail videos, okay? 
Okay, this is not the example as in follow this pattern. This is the example like don't do it this way. Please notice if you look at the text here, beginning in chapter, uh, chapter 10, beginning in the first verse here, moreover, brethren, I do, um, I, I would not that you should be ignorant. And now what he's talking about is ignorant of scriptures. There's too many folks that are ignorant of scriptures, okay? How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat of the spiritual meat and, all, and did all drink of the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock is Christ. He is he's immediately going back to the story of the Exodus. He's talking about the Exodus and going passing uh, through the cloud. In other words, this... Um, when God put the cloud down that separated the children of Israel from, the, uh, from the, uh, the rest of the Egyptians, he set, opened up the Red Sea. Here they were on this side of the cloud and the Red Sea before them, and they passed over with Moses. They identified not with Egypt. They identified with Moses. And so they came out the, uh, in, the, in that. Then he also talked about the manna, and he also talked about the water. And when he struck the rock and the water came out. So in other words, they were all... Everyone that came out of Egypt did the right thing. And they all participated and, and, and enjoyed the benefits of that relationship that they established with Moses in, in, leaving, in, in leaving Egypt. They all did the right thing. So did that guarantee that everything was going to be peachy for them in the future? that everything was going to work out wonderfully for them. So here's, here's the, this is what Paul is now going to talk about. It's, it's, his life, it's like he's looking at somebody here in our church, right? Any one of us and say, listen, yeah, you, you got saved. I, I, don't, I don't deny that. And, and you have, you have you know, come and you, you've identified with Christ. You came out of, <laughs> out of Egypt. You came out of the world. Um, you are now enjoying the benefits of that relationship with Christ. But please, just because you got saved doesn't mean that you can get away with this stuff that's going on in the church. He starts, verse number 6. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I read down to verse number 4, verse number 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So this wilderness journey really separated out a lot of folks. Now these things were written, excuse me, now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Here we go. This is purpose, right? Here's the purpose. Now the purpose, of course, of, is to give us the example. And, and so this is what he's saying. This is the purpose and this idea of lusting. That Lust has to do with the flesh. Often when we use the word lust, we often use it in reference to, to fornication, you know, sexual immoralities. That's often how the word lust is used, and rightfully so. But the word lust itself has to do with any desire of the flesh. So it does not always have to be sexually oriented. It could be anything. I mean, I was joking around today. I went to the doctor's. I got some medication. The doctor said it's, it's going to make me a little edgy. You might end up getting the munchies. And so I'm joking around to Joyce and said, I got a prescription for Doritos. So I'm going to have to buy some Doritos on the way home from the doctor's office. You know, I thought it would be a good plan. All right. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with Doritos, nothing immoral about them. But, you know, there's a lot of people that are just flat-out gut gluttonous. And that's a lust, right? If, you, if a person can't control their, their diets, that's lust. Just like you can't control your sexual immorality, that's lust. Just like you can't control your anger, that's a lust. Anything that is uncontrolled within the flesh is lust. And so he begins to go down this list and talking about the fact that they, they lusted after evil things. Uh, and then he has these uh, one, two, three, four things, verse number seven, eight, nine, and ten, all starts with the word neither. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down and eat and drink and rose up to play. That's making direct reference back to the book of Exodus, chapter 32, and making reference to the, uh, the fact of the golden calf. The children of Israel, of course, were there at Mount Sinai. Moses goes up in the mountain getting the commandments from God. He's up there for 40 days, and they're going, what's the deal? Moses is not coming back. We need to go back to Egypt. It said to Aaron, go build us a, you know, a god 
And, uh, you know, well, I threw, the jewel, I threw the gold in the fire and his calf came out. Good story there, Aaron. I don't buy that one. But, you know, that is lusting after evil things. They sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed. That's sexual immorality, right? And they fell down in one day three and 20,000. That's making direct, direct reference to the book of Numbers, chapter 25, of the events of Baal Peor. And that was, that was a horrible event in the lives of the children of Israel. I mean, they were almost to the promised land. This is, this is like almost at the end of the 40 years. And they're just kind of cruising up along the Jordan River. And they're, you know, it's not going to be very long. They're going to cross over. And they get to this place called Baal Peor. Now, I do want to remind you that, remember, remember Balaam? And uh, Balaam and Balak? Balaam was, st- was in, he couldn't curse them. But he was involved with Baal Peor. He was the one that thought, you know, I can't curse them, but I know what I can do. I can just direct their attention to this, this ungodly, lustful, idolatrous practice that they have. Uh, and these folks will see that, and they'll buy into it 100%, and they did. And, and so the temptations were set before the children of Israel, and, they, and they, they lusted after it, and they paid a dear price for it. Sexual immorality, okay? Um, verse number 9, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. This was a little bit before them. Uh, Bel Peor was like up, up here as far as their wilderness journey, and, and that happened down here with the serpents. And they're just starting to get around the land of the Edomites because the Edomites are going, you can't come through here. So they had to go through the, the rough terrain. And they just complained about it the whole way. Are we there yet? And, and God says, I'm not going to put up with this. And the fiery serpents were because of their murmuring and complaining about how difficult, how difficult it is. Oh, the Christian life is so difficult. Oh, I don't know why God has me go, go through all these trials and struggles and and that's, that's the lust of the flesh. Um, verse number 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed uh, by the destroyer. And that's making, that's making reference. And, uh, most folks relay that to the murmuring that they did against the leadership of Moses, like, for, with, with, for instance, with Korah. It was more murmuring, not about like the murmuring with the serpents, but the murmuring as far as the leadership. And, and so this is all... Even that, that, that's lust, right? Because that's, you know, that's arrogance, that's pride. Uh, we don't want to be led by this guy anymore because we can do this ourselves. We're just as good. I mean, that's what, Mo, that's what Aaron and Miriam did. Why, you know, why is it that you think that only God can give you this ability of leading spiritually this great people? And Moses, man, he just put his head down and said, oh, man, I feel so sorry for you guys because you can't believe what God's going to do to you for this. God pleaded. Uh, Moses pleaded. Uh, for, with, for some mercy for his brother and sister. God was very merciful. But, um, you know, you got to be so careful when you start messing with the things that God has put in place. So all these things are, these, these are all, old. this is like history lesson, right? We're reading this history lesson of the children of Israel, and God's saying these things were written for, for, as an example to you. These are the patterns, these are the fail videos that I want you to watch. You can laugh all you want. But I hope you learned the lesson, because you don't want to do this. And he's writing to the church in Corinth, because they have, this is, the, this is the stuff that's going on with them. He said, don't you, didn't you learn the lesson? You read this stuff, just like anybody, any, anybody who can pick up a Bible can read these things. There's some lessons to be learned. And these are written not just for entertainment, and not just for history, and not just so you can say, I read my Bible today. These are written so we can learn something from them. And so they're, they're examples. They provide us examples. Now, uh, I got uh, the th- uh, three particular things underneath there, if you would please. They provide for us ad- uh, admonition, okay, admonishment. Uh, notice in verse number, uh, verse, number, verse number 11, these things are um, happened unto them for example. So it happened to them, but we get the benefit from it, right? It's always good when bad things happen to other people that, and we can learn from it because it's better than bad things happening to us and going, oh, I get it now, all right? So, uh, for they were written for our admonition, okay? That word admonition is an interesting word. It has to do with the mind. Admonishment has to do with the mind. 
It has to do with to set your mind to something. That's the best way I know how to describe it as far as the definition of the word itself, to set your mind to something. In other words, to get you to think about it. It was written so that you would stop and think about it. So the next time you're reading your Bible and you go through some Old Testament passages and you're reading all these things and you think, oh, this is a great story. I love reading the story. And then you're, you know, you're listening to it on the dramatized Bible and you're hearing the sword fights and everything. You're going, this is great stuff, you know. And, and the kids are hearing stories and you're telling your kids stories about David and Goliath and they're thinking, this is great. So you really realize the purpose that God has given for these things to be written is so we would get our minds focused on those things. We would think about the lessons. We'd think about what we can learn from that. We look at the example, the pattern. What's the good that's sitting there that I can, I can pattern my life after? And what are the bad things that I have to look at and go, oh, that's a, I don't want to do that. So that's the purpose. Admonition has to do with the mind being focused upon something, paying attention to the lesson that is there. Okay, admonition. Please notice in verse number 12, it says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So another thing that, the, that this example provides is perspective. That word take heed has to do with paying attention to something. It's, it's like get the perspective. All right? If I, if I need to take heed, that means that I'm in a situation which possibly could go the wrong way. So you're, you're sitting there. I was joking around about cutting trees. I've cut down a lot of trees in my life. And I know, Brother Denny, you've cut down more than one. Tom, you've, you've put down a few trees. Um, I used to go with my father-in-law all the time. Him, him and I both had uh, wood stoves, so we cut trees down a lot. And, um, and so, you know, most of the time when you're in a big open field, you think it's not a big deal. I remember my father-in-law and I cutting down this tree one time. It was it was big open area. There was no houses or anything around. The truck was way over here. And, and I use, I, I love chainsaws. I used to use, I, if I could cut, I would cut. You know, my father-in-law was fine with that because he was an old guy, you know, let the young guy do it. So, you know, I'm cutting away on this tree one time. And like I said, there was nothing around. So there was nothing I was really concerned about. And all of a sudden this tree is, you know, I'm, I'm doing it all right. I'm going to put that tree right there, you know. And it's, it's starting to go. And then all of a sudden I hear it just started cracking. And then it started spinning in midair. And whenever trees are spinning in midair, it makes you a little unnerving. You know, and, and I'm watching this tree spinning, and all of a sudden it started falling in my direction. And here I am with my chainsaw waiting for this thing to go that way, and then all of a sudden it's, ah, oh, I tell you, take heed. In other words, pay attention. And I mean, it was fine. You know, I saw it. It was, you know, I had the chainsaw. I, I actually sat the chainsaw down and kind of got out of the way. I, I thought maybe it's not a good idea to run with a chainsaw. Not that I saw a video about it anyway. This is back in the, in the 70s or early 80s, so there was no, no videos back then. But I, I knew enough to get out of the way so I didn't get hit with a tree. Okay? Taking heed is simply that, paying attention to the situation because of the possibilities. Because if you think, oh, nothing can go wrong, that's what it's saying. Take heed. As, I mean, I'll read that verse of Scripture again. It says, once I find it, therefore, him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. In other words, if you sit there and think nothing's going to go wrong, everything's fine, I'm going to be okay, that's when it's the most dangerous. So you're going through your Christian life and stuff is happening and you're thinking to yourself, no, this, everything's going to be fine. It's not going to be fine. One of the things or the purpose of the examples is to remind us that if bad things could happen, yeah, you get the idea? Take heed. Please notice also a third thing, and as I finish up here quickly, not only does it give us, and I use the word perspective in there because that's our perspective. That is that we are looking at the situation from our perspective and we're making the determination that things could happen and I need to be careful. And, and then the third thing, if you would please, is, un, is understanding. 
Please notice verse number 13. Great verse of Scripture. There, uh, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. That was written in reference to the context of these examples. In other words, what, the, what Paul is writing is, he said, every one of these examples that I just put before you, this idolatry, this committing of fornication, this tempting of Christ, this murmuring in the wilderness, every one of them had the potential for tremendous destruction, but also every one of them had the possibility of going through them without, any, without suffering any problems. Every one of them. What that meant was, is that all the children of Israel were equal when they went into the wilderness, and because they would not take heed, because they would not follow God's instructions, they paid a penalty for it, but they didn't have to. And here we are in our Christian lives going through the same struggles. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, everyone goes through these same things. And everyone has the potential thinking that they're going to stand and end up falling. But we don't have to. There's always a way to make it through this wilderness journey unscathed without suffering the fail part of the consequence. We don't have to. That's the understanding that we're, we're not doomed because we're going through the wilderness. Everyone goes through the wilderness. But if we're willing to follow the examples, take heed to them, understand the reason they're written for us is to give us some, some admonition, to get our minds focused on what we need to do, we can survive all of these things. Now, this book, the Word of God that's in front of you, was written for a purpose, to give us help through this wilderness journey. It is, first of all, for our learning and for our example. Certainly, again, this whole book was not written directly to you. It's written to a lot of different individuals and churches and particular nations. So it's not written to you directly, but it's written for you purposefully. So whatever God chose to write to, for instance, the church in Corinth, is going to benefit you greatly because God has a purpose for it. So as we read through our Bibles, as we sit and listen to preaching or teaching, as you spend time in this book, please understand that every time you open it, God has a purpose for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord. It's a great blessing to be able to be in your house tonight, to spend just a little bit of time in your word. I'm so thankful, Lord, that the word of God is quick and powerful. It's living. It's active. It has purpose. And I'm so thankful, Lord, that this purpose has um, uh, been shown to us even tonight in these just, uh, small portions of Scripture. And, Lord, I, I do pray that you would encourage us every time that we open your word to look, to set our minds towards it, to open up our hearts to the instructions, the examples, and the purpose that you have for us. Lord, thank you for your precious word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just remain.